Thank you. I will be addressing uh, post-operative issues and long-term follow-up following your debulking uh, or cytoreductive surgery, uh, that being issues uh, from the time you leave the hospital uh, until you're recovered from your surgery, and then how we will follow you uh, during the months and years after your, after your uh, operative procedure. Most people ask how long it will take to recover from the surgery, and it's a, a process that both involves your time in the hospital as well as after your discharge from the sur surgery and, and additional recovery at home. Uh, the length of time really depends on several factors, including your condition and strength going into the procedure, uh, as well as the magnitude of the operation, how much is done at the time of surgery, and whether or not there are any complications during your stay, which can have a significant uh, impact on the length of time needed for recovery. Uh, but the, the length of time generally ranges from about four weeks to, to six or eight weeks until you're back to functional status. Uh, and in general, patients feel better than they did before their surgery about three months after the operation. This has been covered uh, in another session, but to review the complications we see following uh, this large operation uh, includes uh, patients needing to go for a second operation during their hospital stay about 8% of the time, uh, a leak at a, an astomosis or connection between the GI tract uh, about 7% of the time, uh, significant infections or abscesses or, or what's called sepsis uh, about 4% of the time, uh, disruptions in the wound, which can be uh, minor or significant, uh, about 4% of the time, and then issues related to pulmonary function, cardiac function, uh, bleeding, and pulmonary embolus or significant blood clots that can affect the lungs and circulation. Uh, all told, about 30% or one in three of the patients undergoing the surgery will have a significant complication during their recovery. On average, patients will be in the hospital about 12 days. Uh, that means half the patients will be in the hospital longer than 12 days, and those patients having a significant complication uh, this day can easily be three, uh, sometimes four weeks or longer. The issues once patients leave the hospital uh, center around nutrition uh, and hydration, uh, eventually whether or not additional treatment will be needed for their uh, cancer or tumor, or whether chemotherapy would be appropriate. Uh, and in about a third of patients, uh, as covered before, an ileostomy will be placed at the time of surgery, and at some point uh, this will be reversed uh, so that uh, GI function returns to normal. Uh, the first topic to cover is nutrition. Uh, most of these operations involve uh, removing or at least affecting uh, some part of the GI tract. Sometimes uh, several segments of the uh, gastrointestinal tract are removed, and it does take uh, time for things to recover and to start functioning normally. Uh, in some patients, uh, a significant percent of the uh, small intestine and or the large intestine is removed, and the consequences of this can be uh, a limited ability to take in calories, Often going to be uh, a period of days to weeks before significant or sufficient calories are taken in so that patients can get by just by what they can take by mouth. Uh, and more importantly, during this uh, period right after surgery, uh, if patients aren't able to take much in by mouth and they aren't, aren't able to take enough fluid in, uh, they may need to get additional support uh, in terms of fluid uh, intravenously. Uh, a fraction of patients will have... Uh, a period of time where they're unable to take anything by mouth. This is called a, an ileus uh, and may be related to the handling of the intestine, the removal of the many tumors on the intestine, removing a segment of the intestine, uh, or a contribution from the, uh, the heating and the chemotherapy. Uh, and this is particularly difficult and can sometimes take uh, weeks uh, for patients to be able to start taking uh, intake again. Occasionally, uh, there can be a, an actual physical obstruction, uh, which usually is managed similar to ileus, just in terms of providing support, uh, both in terms of fluid and calories through an intravenous catheter uh, until these uh, obstruction or, or uh, ileus resolve. Uh, for patients who have had a significant portion of their intestine taken out, 
there is an adaptive process that takes place over uh, weeks to months uh, where the remaining intestine uh, becomes able to absorb more calories than it could previously. Uh, and this is what we refer to as the short bowel syndrome. And again, often nutrition is needed intravenously until the intestine adapts to its new length. Uh, a fraction of patients will develop an entercutaneous uh, fistula, uh, which is a leakage of gastrointestinal contents out through the intestine and usually out through a drainage tube or, or the incision. Uh, and in patients with this, often uh, additional nutritional support is needed uh, through an intravenous catheter uh, until the fistula can be corrected, it heals up on its own, uh, or they're able to absorb enough calories uh, by mouth. Uh, the next issue I wanted to cover was uh, uh, systemic chemotherapy or additional uh, treatment uh, with chemotherapy through the bloodstream uh, in addition to what patients receive at the time of surgery. Most co patients coming for surgery have also already received uh, chemotherapy in some form before they're referred for surgery, and often patients will receive this again uh, after their surgery. Uh, the the uh, uh, the decision-making process includes uh, whether or not we were uh, comfortable and able to achieve our goal of removing all of the tumor in the abdominal cavity or whether or not a complete cytoreductive procedure was performed. Uh, we do take care of patients with different cancer types coming from different organs uh, of different uh, behaviors. Some of these benefit certainly from chemotherapy and, and others uh, chemotherapy is less likely to be effective and less likely to be beneficial. Uh, I'll talk about the three most common patients we see, those patients with colon cancer, those patients with tumors of the appendix, or what's called pseudomyxoma peritonei, and those patients with mesothelioma. For patients with colon cancer, uh, it's one of the more common things we treat, uh, and the group of patients who we know the most about from the standpoint of taking care of them. Uh, this is a, a graph showing the outlook for all patients who have spread of colon cancer throughout their abdominal cavity, uh, enrolled in a, uh, a recent trial. Uh, this is a trial that compared patients who had uh, just received traditional chemotherapy back in the 1990s versus those patients who had a cytoreductive operation performed and then went on to receive the traditional chemotherapy afterwards. Uh, this study shows uh, 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 a graph showing the percentage of patients still alive after the beginning of the treatment or the surgery, and those patients who receive the HIPEC or the intra-abdominal chemotherapy along with chemotherapy once they'd recovered uh, lived longer than those patients who just received chemotherapy through the bloodstream. So uh, our feeling is that the two modalities uh, work together to, to uh, produce the best outcome. And so patients that we're treating with colon cancer, once they've had a sur the surgical procedure and have recovered, we feel benefit from additional chemotherapy. Uh, this, again, is a trial that was, although published recently, completed in the 1990s with what we would consider old chemotherapy and with treatments that are available today, including a number of new agents not used in this trial, we expect the outcome to look uh, significantly better than this. For patients who have tumors of the appendix, uh, they come in essentially two different varieties. One that uh, is a, a more benign form, or what we call DPAM, in which the tumor itself is rather benign. It's just escaped the appendix uh, early on when it ruptured and these benign behaving cells have spread throughout and seeded the abdominal cavity. Uh, that's one form of the disease we see. The other form is more a traditional cancer and behaves very similarly to colon cancer, and that's what's referred here to PMCA. But in a similar graph here showing uh, patient outcome over a period of time, those patients with the initial form do very, very well, uh, and this is for the most part, without any additional treatment. So patients with this form of the disease would not benefit from any additional therapy once they've had their surgery and recovered. For those patients with the more traditional form of cancer, similar to colon cancer, uh, we usually recommend, once they've recovered from surgery, to go on and have additional chemotherapy through the bloodstream. And then finally, patients with mesothelioma. Uh, again, there are sort of two forms of mesothelioma. One is a, a more aggressive form, a high-grade form, uh, sometimes referred to as sarcomatoid. For these patients, often 
uh, they may not be candidates initially for a cytoreductive operation or if an incomplete cytoreduction is performed or if a good surgery is performed but it is an aggressive form, those patients, there are some options for effective chemotherapy, including agents cisplatin and Olympta, which may provide additional benefit. For those patients who have a more benign, low-grade form, sometimes called papillary, uh, additional chemotherapy may not be uh, advantageous. The third thing I wanted to talk about was reversal of the ileostomy. Uh, this is performed in about a third of patients undergoing these surgeries, particularly when the uh, sigmoid colon and upper rectum are removed. Uh, what we look at when we're deciding on a time frame for removing this is whether or not the, when, when you've recovered from your initial operation, obviously it's a big operation, we like to see you home, your wounds healed, eating well, uh, not being dehydrated, uh, if at all possible, uh, before considering an operation. As I said before, the recovery is usually four to eight weeks, and so it's usually six to eight weeks after your surgery when we begin talking about the second procedure of the reversal of the ileostomy and scheduling that. Uh, occasionally, the nutritional status and hydration status may come into play. For patients who have had a significant portion of their small intestine uh, removed and still have a large intestine in place, often there are considerable fluid losses out through the ileostomy, which occasionally can be difficult to keep up with, and occasionally patients will need intravenous fluid from time to time. And in those patients, uh, often they benefit from having the ileostomy reversed sooner uh, rather than later, uh, and we tend to do it at the earlier time frame in this situation. Occasionally, patients have a, an aggressive form of cancer, and we feel that it's important for them to start as soon as possible uh, on additional chemotherapy, and often we'll recommend that they start with their chemotherapy and after they've received it for a period of time, then come back again and have the ileostomy reversed. In order to get ready for the procedure, we do do a, a contrast study of the lower intestine to make sure that the connections that we've put the ileostomy there for in the first place have healed, and a contrast enema or a barium enema will show each of these connections and we make sure that they, they're completely healed before taking down the ileostomy. This is a picture of what the ileostomy uh, looks like. Uh, generally, it's placed right here at the end of the small intestine. Uh, this cartoon shows the stomach. The stomach goes into the small intestine, which is about 8 to 10 feet in length normally, and then the large intestine uh, is beyond that. If we take out segments of the large intestine, particularly in this location, and connect uh, here, we make this ileostomy uh, upstream from it so that the uh, GI contents exit the body. Uh, in this location and do not go through here until this has had a chance to heal. This is uh, what it looks like uh, up close. Uh, in general, this measures about an inch across uh, and has the two ends uh, visible here. When we do the ileostomy reversal surgery, as opposed to the initial operation, we just make a small limited incision right around this site, which is usually in the right lower side of the abdominal cavity, uh, and the incision is uh, smaller and the recovery a little bit easier than the initial operation. Once uh, patients have recovered, we keep a close eye on them uh, for any signs of their cancer recurring. Uh, we do have a protocol where we f follow patients with CT scans. Uh, usually we do this during the first year after surgery at three-month intervals. The first three-month scan is really to look at what things look like after the surgery. We often have removed quite a bit of stuff, including the tumor, as well as uh, uh, segments of the, of the gastrointestinal tract and organs. And so a first scan just sort of gives us the lay of the line at land after your surgery. And then we go on to repeat it three months, at six months, at nine months uh, for any signs of change from that first scan done at three months. We also do blood tests uh, uh, before your initial surgery. Uh, there's blood tests for colon cancer or a CEA level. There's sometimes something called a CA-199 or a CA-125 will also be elevated. Uh, and those markers, if they're elevated initially, and after the initial surgery come down to, to lower values, they can be very useful in, in uh, following uh, at monthly or two-monthly intervals for signs of anything uh, returning. And then uh, I wanted to show you a couple examples of scans that we have from, uh, from our patients to show what we're looking for uh, to illustrate the, the baseline scan and the surveillance scan. 
this is a lady who had ovarian cancer that we treated. Uh, she had originally undergone a hysterectomy uh, at age 59 in 2002 and then was referred to us with this scan. Uh, this is a, uh, the liver here uh, and a scan through the upper abdomen. Uh, this is the stomach uh, filled with the contrast uh, that's drunk before the scan. Uh, and this material here, this dark gray material, uh, is, the, is, the, is the tumor that forms a rind here between the diaphragm and the liver at this level. Well, she went on to have a, a surgery to have that removed and other uh, tumor deposits throughout her abdominal cavity. And then she returned to have these scans done where we carefully look uh, again here between the liver uh, and the diaphragm for any signs of, of any trouble. This is a, her first scan that she had done. Uh, we see something that we were uh, concerned about initially, which is a small area similar to what we saw on our scan before surgery that looks uh, like fluid or tumor. But as we go on to follow this at, uh, at three-month intervals, we see that this really doesn't change from one scan to the next. Her blood tests have all been normal, uh, and this is why the first three-month scan is critical. It's showing us uh, something that may just be a result of the surgery uh, that then hasn't changed now for over a year uh, in this patient. This is another uh, a patient who had uh, cancer of the appendix. Uh, he again had a similar uh, scan showing a tumor here between his liver and the rib cage or diaphragm. Similar material here in the uh, other side of the abdomen here between his spleen and rib cage on the left side. Uh, quite a bit of material uh, in front of his stomach. And he went on to have surgery. Uh, we felt initially that, uh, that we removed uh, the majority of this material. Uh, he came back again to have his scans, and he had uh, some material uh, around his liver, and we've gone on to keep an eye on that. And in his case, this is uh, uh, grown uh, and appears to be a regrowth of his tumor. So uh, this is somebody who appears to have a recurrence of his uh, appendiceal tumor, uh, during the, the period from three to six months after his initial surgery, and he's gone on to receive additional chemotherapy because of this. Uh, this is a lady uh, uh, with an ovarian cancer who, uh, who we've treated. Again, here b b behind her liver, when we first saw her, were a number of spheres here that uh, represent uh, her tumor from her ovary, which has uh, recurred up here around her liver and her upper abdomen. Uh, in her lower abdomen, there are uh, two spheres here, which are, are abnormal. Uh, she went on to have all of these uh, tumors removed along with the intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And again, as we watch her, uh, we're keeping a careful eye on those sites. Uh, and for now, these things appear normal. I think I'll finish up, uh, I'll finish up there. This is just a, a slide showing the growth of the carcinomatosis program here at the UPMC, uh, showing the number of cases done uh, and expanding from about uh, 15 to 20 cases uh, in 2001, now to close to 100 cases uh, here in 2007. Thank you.